Well, last week we learned about the three types of Old Testament law, the moral, the ceremonial, and the judicial. What we learned is that the ceremony and judicial law were prophetic and that they were both pointing forward like prophets to Jesus. And the ceremonial law allowed Israel to receive atonement for sins until the Messiah came. And the whole time, the ceremonial law pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, as well as pointing to other spiritual truths. Now, the judicial law revealed the seriousness of sin. It helped the nation of Israel govern the people before the Messiah came. And it pointed forward to the second coming of Jesus, when he's going to judge the world for sin once and for all, and put an end to all of it. Now, we spent most of our time last week looking at the third type of the law, the moral law. And we looked at the first four of the Ten Commandments and how they're repeated and strengthened in the New Testament. We learned that the first four commandments are based in reality, the reality of who God is, the very nature of God, and the holiness of his name as well as how he created everything in six days and rested on the seventh. Now we saw that the first four commandments are fulfilled by love for God and that his Holy Spirit within us allows us to love as we should. But we must walk after the Spirit's leading and not after our old fleshly way of thinking. So this morning... Let's go back in our Bibles again to Matthew 5, 17 through 19, and remind ourselves of the words of Jesus. He told us, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law, until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches these commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Well, this week, before we continue to look at the Ten Commandments, to understand why we should still keep and teach them as Jesus just taught us, I want to take a moment to explain the basic difference between the Old and New Testament in our Bibles. When we say the word testament, it simply means covenant or agreement. So there was an old covenant and now there's a new covenant. The book of Hebrews is amazing about explaining the difference between the two, comparing them. But the first or old covenant as given through Moses was based on the blood of animals. But the new covenant as given by Jesus, like we saw at the Last Supper, is founded in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now the old covenant had imperfect priests that had to deal with sin in their own life and they all eventually died. But the new covenant has a sinless, eternal Son of God as our high priest seated in heaven itself, finished with all sacrifice for sins. Now the old covenant had the moral law written in stone, but the new covenant has the moral law written on our hearts and minds. But let's not take my word for it. Let's look at Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, or Hebrews 10, 16 through 17. This fact is repeated in all those passages, but we'll look at Hebrews 10. The Lord said, This is the new covenant I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. He adds, I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. See, in this new covenant, thank the Lord, we have forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the second part of the new covenant is that the law of God is written on our hearts and our minds. Now, how does God write 
on our hearts and our minds. Well, the Holy Spirit within us writes the law on our hearts and minds and enables us even to fulfill the requirements of the law as long as we follow after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Now that we're reminded of the only way we can keep the commandments as Jesus told us in the passage this morning, let's look at the next commandment. The fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. Now the reality is that God gave everyone a mother and a father. Based on the fact of who they are, we ought to honor them as God's provision for us. See, this commandment is the first one about relationships with people instead of God. And obviously, in God's design, our parents are the first people on earth that we have a relationship with. Now, the command to honor our father and mother is about loving and respecting the people that God used to bring us into the world and the people who cared for us when we were still helpless, needy, stinky, and really kind of not fun to be around. Jesus taught that the fifth commandment, along with several other commandments, was the key to eternal life. He tells the young man in Matthew 19, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked him. Jesus answered, do not murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And as with all but the fourth commandment, Paul clearly restates them, as he covered this one in Ephesians 6. Obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. See, God gave us the parents that we have, and we should honor them. Sometimes, due to sin, they may not be perfect, but we can still treat them with respect and honor, within limits. So, what are the limits? In Luke 9, 59 through 60, we read, Then Jesus said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he, Jesus, told him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go spread the news of the kingdom of God. See, we must put Jesus first, then everything else falls into place. If your parents are a hindrance to following Christ, honor them as you follow Jesus, not instead of following him. Now this plays out in different ways for everybody because due to sin, there's almost as many different situations as there are different people in the world. But we must put Jesus first as a rule and then ask God how we can best honor our parents in our present situation. He will lead us. But the principle of honoring our parents is revealed in 1 Timothy 5.4 where Paul writes, if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must learn to practice godliness toward their own family first and repay their parents, for this pleases God. See, charity begins at home. God wants us to help take care of our families before we go setting out to helping others. That's the intent of this verse. And Jesus rebuked the Pharisees when they taught people the opposite idea. In Matthew 15, Jesus answered them, Why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and the one who speaks evil of father and mother must be put to death. But you say, Whoever tells his father and mother whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple, he does not have to honor his father or mother. In this way, you've revoked God's word because of your tradition. See, we see Jesus scolding the Pharisees because they're using man-made tradition and thinking instead of God's word to teach the people to ignore God's word. And if we love God, we'll be grateful for our parents. If for nothing else, then he used them to give us life. And if we love our parents, we'll honor them as God has commanded. 
The next commandment, number six, is do not murder. All human beings were created in the image of God. And we see this plainly in Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Because of who our Creator and Savior is, each and every person has value. And to take a life or even hate and not value someone's life is to forget the intrinsic value of that person that they have because they're made in His image. The fact is, their value is based on the fact of who created us all, not their actions or their merits. See, even Hitler was made in God's image, and although he sinned in many horrible ways, we're not to hate the sinner, we're to hate the sin. And because of the horrible things that sinners do, they're going to face a horrible eternity unless they turn to Christ. And that fact should cause us to pray for them and share truth with them in love, not hate or murder them. Sin is the problem, but people aren't the problem. Now, murder is a sin that forgets the reality of who made us all and the fact that we bear his image. In 1 John 3.15, we read, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now, this is taken indirectly from the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And John plainly teaches that even hating our brother is the same as murder. And if we're a murderer, we don't have eternal life residing in us. Now, obviously, if we love our brother, we won't hate him, and we won't murder him. So that one's pretty easy. Now the seventh commandment is, do not commit adultery. Now this commandment, when properly understood, is not just for those of our culture calling, they say they're married, but it really it covers a whole range of sexual sin. Because in this commandment, adultery is basically any sexual intimacy that occurs outside of God's unchanging definition of marriage. The fact is that God only has approved one scenario for reproduction and sexual union. It's the scenario of one man and one woman for life as revealed in Genesis by Jesus as well in the New Testament. Marriage was invented by God in Genesis 2. And Jesus recounts this passage in Matthew 19 when asked about divorce. He said, he who created them made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. And they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Here, the Creator Himself explains that marriage is based on the reality of the creation and the nature of the Creator, just like the rest of the moral law. See, first Jesus points out that this is how it's been since the very beginning. God did not change marriage. It was sin when they married in a different way than the way God originally made it. Next, the Creator explains that He made us to have two complementary sexes, male and female. This was his design from the beginning. Then the Creator explains that every man, after Adam and Eve, had a mother and a father, and that the man leaves the home of his parents to join with his wife. Notice, Jesus is revealing the simple, basic, generational, ongoing way marriage works. From a mother and a father, to a husband and wife, to be repeated until the end of time. Also, Jesus did not say that a man left his parents to join with his girlfriend or boyfriend. Instead, the first person he joined with was his wife. Obviously, Jesus was politely referring to intimacy when he said the word joined. And in case we missed it, Jesus explains that the two become one flesh obvious imagery. 
Then Jesus explains how long marriage is supposed to last, saying, what God has joined together, man must not separate. So this passage reveals how the inventor and creator of marriage is providing us with an unwavering definition of marriage that will stand from the very beginning to the very end of time, regardless of what man says or does. Now, why is it this way? Well, because it's actually how God really created it in the garden. And he offers forgiveness when we stray from this pattern. But he calls for us to live in this pattern from the time we come to him onward. And I cannot emphasize enough that all of the commandments are steering us back to the fundamental reality of God's created order and the unparalleled character of God. They're not arbitrary rules to keep us from good things, but facts based on reality to keep us from bad things. And they can only be fulfilled by love for God and love for each other. If we love God, we'll honor the relationship of marriage that he invented. And if we love our partner, we won't cause them to sin by engaging in a relationship that's outside of God's one approved design. Hebrews 13.4 explains how serious it is if we abandon God's pattern for marriage. Marriage must be respected by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. Even though our culture is trying to undermine God's word in every way possible, the Bible stands firm throughout the ages from Genesis to now until the end of time since God defines marriage and God defines what sin is. It will always be one man shall join to one woman just as it was with Adam and Eve. Now people can try to redefine or modify what God created all they wanted to but God's moral law isn't going anywhere. Now, the Eighth Commandment is do not steal. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 makes it plain in a list of other sins. No thieves will inherit God's kingdom. So stealing is taking anything that doesn't belong to you, regardless of its value. It is always wrong. Now, sometimes we steal because we're coveting. And we'll cover that coveting in a little while. But sometimes we steal because we have needs. And the fact is, God will supply our needs, but he does it conditionally. He gives us work to do and the strength to do it and tells us to use the gift that he's given us to meet our needs. Now, if we use the gifts God gives us, God supplies our needs. And since the gifts came from God and the opportunity to work came from him and our lives come from him, the results come from him. If we steal rather than earn what we need, we're rejecting the reality of work that God established. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes, In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he shouldn't eat. For we hear that there's some among you who walk irresponsibly, not working at all, but interfering with the work of others. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ that quietly working, they may eat their own food. God gives us the ability, strength, and intellect, and opportunity to earn a living. And Paul commands that we use what God has given us. Like the Sabbath, God gave us these gifts to be used and to meet our needs whenever possible. Now, if we cannot work due to sickness or age or some other factor, the New Testament reveals that God commands our family and our church to pray for us for healing, and if God chooses not to heal us, to help take care of us. Now, when we steal from someone, we're not treating them as we would want to be treated. And we're obviously not loving them as we should. And if we refuse to work, 
we're not loving God properly because love for God is keeping his commands. So if we steal anything, we're rejecting the reality that it was not ours, but our neighbor's property that we wrongfully took, revealing that we lack in love for our neighbor. The ninth commandment is do not give false testimony against your neighbor. On the street, this one goes, don't lie. Now, Revelation tells us that among the list of other sinners, liars will have their part in the lake of fire. So to lie is to knowingly deny reality itself. And typically it's to serve yourself in some way. Now truth is the accurate representation of how things really are, but lies are intentional misrepresentations of the facts. Truth is always true, no matter how many people believe it, because God knows what the truth is, and he's given it to us in his word. Now lies are wrong, no matter how many people believe them, because the truth does not change. Now we are instructed to speak the truth in love, while always speaking words that build people up toward Christ's likeness. So if someone asks you, do I look good in this? You don't have to crush them. Speak the truth in love. Truth always sets people free, but lies put people into bondage. This is what Satan did in the garden to Eve. So if we truly love someone, we will not lie to them. We will speak the truth in love. Now the 10th commandment is, do not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Ephesians 5, 3 through 5 tells us, Immorality, impurity, and greed must not even be named among you as proper for saints. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or greedy person who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Coveting and greediness are fruit on the same diseased tree of discontentment. In both cases, we're not satisfied with what God has already given us, and we desire either more than we currently have or someone else's stuff. Paul explains in 1 Timothy, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish, harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. If God is gracious enough to give us food and clothing, everything else is icing on the cake. We should just be thankful for what we have. But if we fall into the trap of desiring riches, the New Testament has many strong warnings for us to read. The love for God makes us grateful for what he gives us, and love for our neighbor makes us happy that they have good things. Now we have seen that God's moral law is clearly repeated in the New Testament. And next week we'll see how it was the foundation for the rest of Jesus' sermon. He's going to expound on the law, as we move forward in the Sermon on the Mount. And we learn that every commandment is fulfilled by love, and love is the spirit of every one of those commandments. The moral law clearly calls us to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can do this by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, who we received by repentance and faith in Christ. See, the Spirit allows us to fulfill the law by giving us new hearts that we have to choose to follow day by day in love. Jesus told us to keep and teach his commands, but as the world gets darker in the coming days before the Lord's return, it's going to become increasingly hostile to the light of God's perfect moral law. We'll need to rely on God more and more in the coming days. 
And we must remember this. To operate outside of God's commandments is sin. And the wages of sin is death. And only Jesus can set us free from that condemnation and give us the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. Now, if we refuse to repent, Paul tells us the danger of all sin in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Paul warns, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived. No, not one sexually immoral person, idolater, adulterer, or anyone practicing homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers, will inherit God's kingdom. This is one of many passages like this in the New Testament. See, all unrighteousness is sin. And Paul explains this fact. If we practice sin, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. This is not a bigoted or unloving or intolerant or ungracious statement. It's just the truth. It's the reality of how God made things. And he plainly revealed them in his word. And the only way to truly love someone who's on their way to hell is to explain that they need to repent of those things and turn to Christ. Now, was Paul unloving to write that verse? No, he loved them so much that he let them finally kill him by preaching that kind of truth. And God loves them even more than Paul did. So if we love people, we'll tell them where God draws the line, just like Jesus and Paul did. You see, if we really love people, we won't blur the lines of reality because God clearly has approved some things and clearly condemned others. If we blur the lines, we ourselves condemn the person by not telling them the truth of God's word. The Bible reveals that Jesus came to save us from sin, not leave us in sin. God will judge people based on the holy standards revealed in his law. So the law reveals our sin and our need for Christ. When we repent and turn to Jesus, God forgives us and sends the Holy Spirit to lead us in our walk. And in Jesus, John tells us, we don't sin. But if we stumble, we simply confess it and turn back to Jesus. God forgives us and cleanses us from our unrighteousness. But this is the purpose of the law. The law is the permanent line between sin and God. And repentance and faith in Jesus is the only way over that line. We don't abide in Jesus by our own efforts, but by walking after the Holy Spirit in faith, hope, and love. But if we refuse to walk after the Spirit and continue to obey the flesh, we will keep living in sin. And if we keep on breaking God's moral law, he'll judge us as he promises in Hebrews 10, 26 through 27. If we deliberately keep on sinning, there's nothing waiting but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fire about to consume the adversaries. That is why the law is still necessary to define sin. The moral law is the line to identify what actions are sin, just as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. The law is meant for the sinner to show them they have a deadly problem. It's not meant for the righteous person who's not sinning. It's meant for the sinner. Paul also wrote that God's firm foundation is inscribed, inscribed with the words, the Lord knows those who are his. And Everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away or repent from all unrighteousness. 
Friends, Jesus died to pay for our sins so that we could receive the Holy Spirit who will enable us to live in freedom. That's what that foundation tells us. Jesus paid the penalty, and when we turn from sin and put our faith in Christ, he cleanses us and transfers us from darkness into light. Then a second miracle happens by God's grace. It's not just forgiveness. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and change our hearts as we surrender to God's word. Then we can walk after the Spirit. And if we do, we'll no longer follow the sinful passions of our flesh. The number one fruit of the Spirit is love. And we've seen that love allows us to fulfill God's commands, just as we've seen over the last two weeks. So love is the ultimate answer to every question on your bulletin. It's an easy day. Just fill that word in at every blank. God solves our sin problem by solving our heart problem. But we, he, the Spirit couldn't be in us until Jesus cleansed us. So he died to cleanse us so we could receive the Spirit and follow the Spirit. Now that we can love like he did, now that we can follow our wonderful Savior by the same Spirit that indwelled him, I pray that we'll be a wonderful example in our lives and in our community of people who live by the power of the Spirit, following after Christ, obeying God's perfect word.